Hello and happy World Watercolor Month. I'm Sandy Alnock. Welcome to my channel. And today I'm going to start off by showing you some supplies I got in a wonderful box along with a painting from my friend Lisa about two months ago. And I've saved it for World Watercolor Month because it's always fun to play with new stuff. These are all partial pads of paper, little blocks in different brands. She knows all the papers will get used around here. So she just sent me all the stuff she couldn't take with her. I'll tell you more about her adventure in a few minutes. But this little book was cute. It's rainbow paper, which is lovely. But she started writing something each day in, in January, whether it's this year or years past, I don't know. But she made it as far as January 3rd. Take care of yourself before others and like that's what they say on the airplane right put your mask on before you help someone else so i'm going to be using this paper it's round italian paper for my painting today and that's going to be fun to paint on something round and new and different and then she also sent these little bowls she's sent me bowls before and I liked them enough that she said, oh, I will get rid of these and send them to Sandy. But she didn't want to wash them out. She said, I will send you the paint too. And you can use the paint or you can wash it out. So I am taking it as a challenge and I'm going to use it today. So my subject matter for this painting is going to be Thimble Peak in Arizona. I thought I could do something with the colors here that were in those dishes. But I also wanted to pick something from the Southwest because my friend Lisa Spangler, who gave me all these supplies, is a nut about going to the Southwest and going hiking and camping and uh, painting and sketching. And she is off on an adventure doing that right now. About a month and a half ago, I guess, she and her husband sold the house in Texas and they got in the van they've custom built and they are just driving all over the place and visiting places and I'm super excited for her. The footage you're seeing right here is one of the places she's going to be going and I wanted to give you a heads up in case you're in New Mexico or will be in the month of August because from August 6th to September 1st she is going to be an artist in residence at Valles Caldera National Preserve. I think that's how you say it. And I don't know what that means. She kind of gave me a general picture of like she has to put on some events and stuff. But if you are going, go see Lisa. I am going to give you all her socials in the doobly-doo. So if you are interested, you're going to be in that area, go follow her. And I'm sure she'll give details on what's coming up and how things are going out there in New Mexico. And on her adventures, wherever else she goes. She's just, oh, she's a wonderful artist and a very dear friend. So let's get on to the painting now. Starting by wetting the paints that are in these bowls. I had to wonder where these bowls have been. What was she painting with them? I assume since she's getting rid of them, she probably wasn't taking them in the van with her. So they might not have been on one of her other adventures that she went before this big permanent uh, leaving the homestead thing. And so I started sketching in my design here in the circle. I was thinking about whether or not I could bend tape around the outside edge to leave a white edge and decided, you know, I'm just going to be tidy in my painting. We will see if that actually pans out or not, because I'm not always known for being tidy, but I thought that would be easier potentially than bending the tape to go all the way around. So sketching in each of the elements. There's a distant mountain, an intermediate mountain, and then the one in the foreground that has all of the scrub brush in it and the saguaros. So I'm going to be testing out these paints. Hadn't uh, swatched anything or tried anything. I was familiar with the colors in general. I've never used Winsor & Newton Smalt before. I've used Daniel Smith Smalt. And it's pretty much just as weak of a color in, in the um, Daniel Smith and the Winsor & Newton both. So I guess it's just the... The hue itself is like that, but using a baby wipe to soften my clouds. There aren't really much for clouds in that picture, of course, but I wanted some interest in the sky back there, not just a big old blob of blue. And baby wipes are my jam to get soft edges because there's a little bit of moisture that it puts on the paper, whereas a paper towel will give harder edges. So I use a paper towel when I want something that's going to be crisper. 
So I could see a few spots here that I wanted to leave with a bit of brown, like some of the earth that was showing that did get taken over later, but I was just trying to mix some colors that were going to work. I wanted an olive green for the underpainting here on this foreground hillside and ended up using the yellow with some green and then dropping in a little bit of red, which is going to sort of demushify and, you know, desaturate the whole color. And it worked pretty well to get the kind of color that I was looking for. And one of the reasons that I'm always just banging on about color theory and understanding how you mix your colors is that if you come to a situation like this and you don't have a color you need, if you know some basics and you've played around with enough color theory, even with paints that you have no idea what you're doing, I, I had zero idea what these were going to do together, then you can at least find a way to make something work that may not be perfect, but it's going to be close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades, as my dad used to say. And that's really what I was going for in this. I wanted to see if I could mix colors to make them do what I wanted. Now, I don't know if Lisa in intended originally to give me a red, yellow, and blue so that I could play with color theory, but she did, so we're calling it good. There's some kind of reddishness that I can see in the mountain in the distance, so I did throw a little bit of that in there, but I was nervous to go too far since I only had smalt to uh, have it play with in there, and I didn't want the red to totally take over because that is a pretty strong red color. But then adding red with the green, you know, even though that's a phthalo green, like a crazy phthalo, you add red to it and it becomes something much more neutral for that intermediate hillside. And uh, that's one of those things that you learn by experience. And I know a lot of people just buy like, you know, 14 dozen colors so that they don't have to learn that. But I'm telling you, it makes a huge difference to be able to simply grab the colors that you've got. I've got just four colors here. I can use any of these colors to create something new. And they may not be the perfect thing that I want, but they're going to be close enough to at least get me started. And that's really what I was looking for here. I wasn't trying necessarily for everything to be perfect and match the photo reference. I just wanted it to be good enough to make a painting out of. Now that the lightest colors are in, I can start adding in a bit of darker values. So the green mixed with the red in thicker fashion is going to give me the darker green that I'm going to start wanting on this hillside on the right hand side. Switch to a bigger brush so I can cover more real estate with it and get more paint mixed as well. A teacher once told me, one of my uh, workshop instructors like was always harping at me to use a bigger brush because I was just using smaller ones. And I know a lot of people run into the same thing. You end up doing death by a thousand strokes because you've chosen a very small brush for an area that's much bigger. And you end up with your painting feeling like it's just fussy detail. And it's because we, we have this tendency to want to try to still make a, a painting, a watercolor painting, look like a pencil drawing with all kinds of very small lines in it. And that's not always the best way to go. You chose watercolor because it's loose and flowy. So get loose and flowy using a bigger brush. So here I'm trying to make some of the negative spaces, do some negative painting around the swaros that are in the front of that, that darker mountain and creating a little bit of structure to the plants themselves. But with the the changes that I'm making to my layout, you know, I, things have gotten a little bit off. So I'm not following the photograph nearly as much as I had begun to do, but still using it for inspiration. That's how I use a lot of photos too. I don't get wedded to, oh my goodness, my colors aren't exactly perfect, or I've moved this plant over, or I've changed the shape of the hillside. A lot of people get very stressed out by that. And I find that to just get in the way, hamper my painting if I start fretting too much about those things. So I just get a little bit looser. I'm looking for general shapes that I can use from the photograph because I'm really working with a circle. I'm not working with the full rectangle, so I can't get everything in there anyway. 
hello dogs in the distance. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Apparently there's a squirrel in the backyard. So switching to a bigger brush so I can start getting some bigger brush strokes. I put some smaller ones in there and it was feeling overly fussy everywhere. And I wanted some areas to be, you know, have that tiny detail, but a lot of them to just be looser and the bigger brush strokes really helped with that to start getting that overall watercolor feeling. A nice satisfying point then, of course, is going to be to put in all of those swaros. I mixed some very thin paint first for the ones that are in the distance because I wanted to create some depth in this front hillside, even though it might look a little bit flat if I lighten the ones that are in the distance and then put darker ones coming forward, then it'll start to build a whole like depth of field in that little hillside that I couldn't get otherwise if I was trying to just replicate the values that I saw. But it was interesting to watch the thalo green, which is normally like crazy bright color, get really dulled down nicely to a deep dark rich green just by mixing in that deep dark red. It's one of those color theory things that I just love about mixing colors and seeing what happens when you try it. I get a lot of questions, well, you know, should I use this color? Should I use that color? What will happen if I mix these? The only way to really learn is to do it. Just try it yourself. And if you don't have a color that somebody on YouTube or somebody in a class or something decides to use, you can use your own colors. Like you can change it. It's okay. <laughs> I give you permission. Now, if you are interested in taking some watercolor classes, then I have a little deal for you. I am raising money along with a bunch of other people this month, World Watercolor Month, for ICAF, which is the International Child Art Foundation. And I believe so wholeheartedly in helping kids to make art in a safe and nurturing environment because, man, I'm telling you, as soon as we grow up, we, we learn that all that stuff that we had so much fun making when we were young, that, oh, it was terrible, it was not good stuff, and we listen to all these crazy voices, and I want kids to get art embedded in their souls when they're little so that they don't have to deal with that. And that's one of the reasons that I support the organization ICAF because I, I just believe in kids being able to be free to make the art that's in their souls. I think we all have art within us and it starts at a very young age and we need to not drill it out of them. We need to drill it into them. So what I'm doing this month is offering a coupon code and you'll find it over on the website. There's a page for all my World Watercolor Month stuff. And you can either take the coupon yourself and get a discount, or you can not take the coupon and all the money goes to the kids. Because I want to help as many kids as possible. And there's like dozens of watercolor classes for all different levels. I just split some of my advanced ones, some of my level four classes into individual lessons. If you want to try one and see if you're ready for a level four class, then you can take them individually. And if you end up deciding after you take one individually that, okay, now I'm ready for the whole enchilada, then you can just email me after you buy the whole enchilada and I will refund you the one that you tried as a tester. So all of that is explained over on my World Watercolor Month page on my website, linked in the doobly-doo, of course. So that was all to occupy you while I was trying not to say, and then we paint an, another saguaro, and then we paint another one, and then we paint another one, and then we mix more paint and we paint another one. <laughs> Sometimes I think these tutorials just get a little bit crazy because stuff repeats, and I was doing a whole lot of repetitive steps here. So I'm trying to add some depth into some of the greenery here, and add a bit of detail in a few spots while I'm doing it. Not detail everywhere. I didn't want everything to be completely crazy full of detail. But I am switching down to, you notice that little tiny brush. Um, when I get into trying to make some areas 
very delicate and interesting, I am willing to go with a tiny brush, but I also try to complement it by having larger brushwork around it because I don't want everything to get itty bitty and overly focused because then it starts to look like a pencil drawing instead of a watercolor painting. For my very last details, I mixed up some dark pigment to do some spattering on here just so I could make something that felt a bit more like some of the flowers, some of the little tiny plants, and had to make sure I got them out of the sky lest they look like bugs flying in the air. <laughs> And then since I had some dark pigment still uh, in process, I thought I'd darken a couple of the saguaro that are going to be in the foreground so that they'll really start to pull forward and push all the other ones even further backwards. So after carefully removing it, this paper didn't have, and like most of them have a natural place to start the peeling. So it does take a little bit of effort to get them off of each other. But uh, there's my finished sketch of Thimble Peak in Arizona. I did another painting and this one I unfortunately couldn't find any footage for. I don't know what I did with it. It was going to be another video here but it's gone and had the uh, same trouble trying to peel it off of here but painted a few cacti with flowers on them. So lots of fun working with Lisa's supplies. Uh, go follow her. Links in the doobly-doo, you're going to want to see her adventures in art and out in the world. I will see you again in my next video. Take care and go keep painting. It's World Watercolor Month. Bye-bye.